Welcome. I'm Alex Service, uh, President of the Board of the Humboldt County Historical Society, and it's a great pleasure to welcome everybody here today. This event is being held on the traditional land of the Wiat people, and we pay respect to elders, both past and present. More information and details about this acknowledgement can be found in your program. This event is a uh, production sponsored by the Humboldt County Historical Society and funded by the California Humanities. And part of the uh, requirements of the grant by which uh, we received the funding is that we return audience response surveys, uh, which you all should have gotten when you came in today. So we do hope that uh, sometime uh, during uh, the event uh, you'll uh, find time to fill that out and uh, return it before you leave. We also have in the lobby a lot of historical society materials, uh, information. Uh, we hope that everyone will take home with them uh, one or two copies of our calendar that we still have many copies of. And uh, we also have uh, free bookmarks, uh, miniatures of uh, historic postcards of Humboldt County, and information about the Humboldt County Historical Society. If you are already a member of the society, we thank you. And if you're not, we hope that everyone will join. So once again, uh, welcome and thank you for being here. Hot, wet, low, raking means greetings to you. Welcome to We Ought Country and our, what are you? Our chairman. <laughs> our chairperson, Ted Hernandez. Wave your hand, Ted, so they know that you're here. I talk about him in his presence, and as soon as he's back his turn, I talk to him about him. Uh, Marnie and her friends have put this together, and thank you, Historical Society. I once sat on the board of the Historical Society, which was very eye-opening, <laughs> and I hope they learned something from what I said and as I was there, and I sure learned a lot as I was there. One of the things I wanted to let you know is that my grandmother, my grandmother taught me when you get up in the morning, you pray. You get up, you go outside, you look to the east, to the rising sun, and you pray, giving thanks for what you have, giving thanks for the journey that you are on, and to welcome those who come who may be coming down the road on their journey to see you. Whether you know that they're on their way or not, you would always welcome them. You welcome them by, I'm inside of a building. That's east? OK, thank you, guys. <laughs> when, once, when I lived in San Francisco, I get inside of a building, I, I am totally lost. Get me outside, I know where I'm at. But my sister and I had a way of communicating with each other. We'd whistle. And she'd whistle, and I'd go, OK, whistle again. And so I'd whistle, and then she'd whistle. And I'd find my way to where she was at, because she would tell me, well, meet me by the north entrance. Where's the north entrance? I don't know where the north entrance is. I'm inside the building. But Grandma would say, you welcome them into your home. You welcomed them from the east, from the south, from the west, and I welcome you from the north. She also say, never let anybody knock upon your door. You will always go out to meet them. Even they might be coming, you still have another 100 feet to come before they get to your front door. You go outside and bring, bring them in. And you always give them refreshment, whether it's cookies, whether it's water, or tea or coffee. You always greet them with food. Then you sit them down, and then you have fun, whatever that fun may be. Sometimes it's shelling peas. Sometimes it's cleaning root are getting ready for a, a big meal. Mussels, abalone, clams, all those things. I'm hungry for uh, surfish right now. 
I don't know, I've been hungry for surfish for about a year now. One of these days I'm going to get some surfish. And so we welcome you to this building and we ask blessings upon this building. So why don't you rise, please? And the gentlemen would take off their hats, showing. She made it, didn't she? <laughs> On the skin of her teeth, she made it to the front row. Duttery Gok with Father God, creator of all things. We thank you for this day. We thank you for all those who are here. We thank you for the many blessings that you've given us. And you're here when the sorrows of our heart are breaking. We've had a horrible last two, three years. And Creator, we know that we're in your guidance. You shine a light upon our path as we go. And if we stumble, we ask you to catch us. If we're lacking in motivation, we ask you to push us forward. And if we need counseling, we look to you. We offer to you our very essence of our abilities to get the work done that you put before us. May you open our ears so that we can hear. You open our eyes so that we may see. And you open our heart that we may have compassion for others. Dari Gakwith. Thank you. Ho. You may be seated. The body of water we know today as Humboldt Bay is the largest bay on the California coast north of San Francisco. Its shape, depth, and the tributaries into it have altered over the millennia due to seismic activity and fluctuations in sea level, both processes still at work. The Mad River, which now reaches the ocean north of our bay, may once have flowed into the bay itself. For many centuries, the Humboldt Bay region and adjacent Eel River Valley has been home to the Weot people. They called the bay Ouija. Their villages dotted its shores and its abundant resources in the waters, marshes, and surrounding forests sustained a rewarding life. Ouija and the adjacent ocean provided an abundance of fish, shellfish, and aquatic mammals while nearby forests and marshes provided good hunting, edible plants, and fibers for basket making. The mounds of seashells near the sites of former villages underscore this interrelationship. The network of trails connecting the Weot people and inland tribes provided useful trade goods such as obsidian for tool making. These trails later became the foundation for the settlers' roads. Early European explorers of the California coast missed the narrow, often fog-enshrouded entrance to the bay. Even famed Sir Francis Drake sailed right past it. However, in 1806, the bay was entered and mapped by a Russian-American expedition hunting along the coast for sea otters. That fur was in such demand in Asia and Europe that the species was nearly driven to extinction. However, it was not until the gold rush hit California in 1849 that Euro-Americans were inspired to seek this reported bay, hoping to use it as a supply port for the newly discovered gold fields along the Klamath and Trinity rivers. In December of 1849, the Greg Wood Party set out west 
from the mines to seek for this reported bay. Reaching the mouth of the Mad River after an arduous trip, they argued, hence the current name, over the direction to head. Eventually turning south, they then came upon our bay. They were greeted by Wiat leader, Kiwi Lata, and others who fed the nearly starving explorers and then directed them to the bay's south shore. A bit further south, the explorers found a river valley where again the local Wiat people helped them, providing delicious roasted lamprey. This caused the grateful newcomers to name the river the Eel. After further trials, some of the party finally reached San Francisco and reported their discovery. Then the rush was on to find an ocean route to the bay. One party mistook the mouth of the Eel River for our bay entrance, and another thought they had found it at Trinidad, which the Spanish had first reported in 1775. The first seekers to enter the right bay were on the Laura, Virginia, in April of 1850. Following some disagreement, they named the bay after the then-renowned German explorer and naturalist Alexander von Humboldt. He was even granted a plot of land on the bay shore. But von Humboldt himself never actually came here. Word of the bay's potential quickly spread. Settlers and entrepreneurs poured in, and within months, several settlements were established, including Bucksport, Eureka, and Union, later renamed Arcata. As settlers took over ever more of the Wiats and other tribal lands, frictions and killings between the two groups mounted. What came to be called the Indian Wars broke out, causing the U.S. Army to establish Fort Humboldt on the south end of the present-day Eureka, as well as several inland forts. There were outright massacres at several villages, and possibly as many as a thousand Wiat and other indigenous people were imprisoned in appalling conditions at Fort Humboldt, then were penned in a corral across the bay on the Samoa Peninsula. The most notorious event of this troubled time occurred in February of 1860. The slaughter of over 80 Wiats, mostly women and children, who were holding a traditional ceremony on Tulawat Island coincided with other massacres in Wiat settlements around the bay and in the Eel River Valley. Outraged reports by Arcata newspaper reporter Brett Hart spread nationwide. Brett was eventually run out of town by indignant locals angered by his reporting, but no one was ever prosecuted for the murders. Some historical research suggests that this was because several of those involved were influential community members. These events marked the beginning of Humboldt's reputation for brutal racism, a reputation that was soon to increase with the white community's anti-Asian discrimination and expulsion. And so, the new era of the Bay's history began in a maelstrom of discovery, hope, conflict, and disaster. More of all was to follow. After 1850, Euro-Americans began settling around Humboldt Bay. They were drawn by the economic potential of supplying the gold fields along the Trinity and Klamath rivers, a burgeoning timber industry, and the rich farmlands nearby. Roads from the south were sketchy, long, and dangerous, so the most used means of travel to the area was by sea. This had its drawbacks as well. The north coast was rocky and prone to heavy fog. Lighthouses were few and often ineffective. The lighthouse built on the north spit of the bay in 1854 proved to be too low and too far from the water to be effective. 
The entrance to the bay itself was shallow and often difficult to detect from out at sea. Efforts to dredge the bay entrance and to shore up its sides with ever-expanding jetties continued over the decades. As a result of all this, our area's history is dotted with marine disasters. Historically, some 60 shipwrecks have been recorded in the Humboldt area. One of the earliest and most spectacular wrecks was of the steamer Northerner in 1860. On its way north, it didn't even get as far as Humboldt Bay, but wrecked off of Centerville Beach. On January 5th, the ship struck a submerged rock past Blunt's Reef. At first, the damage seemed minor, and passengers scoffed at the warning to prepare to board lifeboats. But soon, both passengers and crew were bailing water from a rapidly sinking ship. Distress shots were fired from the ship's cannon. As evening and a storm came on, the crippled ship washed toward a sandbank and began to break up. Lifeboats for women and children were launched, though several sank, and some people made mostly unsuccessful attempts to ride a rope to shore. Locals from indigenous villages and the small settlements of Centerville, Table Bluff, and Ferndale rushed to the beach to help the survivors. The rescuers even included the notorious mountain man, Seth Kinman, who ran a bar and hotel at Table Bluff. In the end, 38 people drowned and were initially buried on the bluff. Seventy years later, this tragedy was commemorated by the native sons of the Golden West, who erected a cross on the bluff overlooking the beach. The monument remains, although due to constant cliff erosion, it frequently topples over. Some 60 years later, the passenger steamer Alaska sailed south from Portland, past Humboldt Bay, but then collided with the same blunt reef area rocks that had done in the northerner. It was the evening of August 6th, 1921, and in less than half an hour, the ship sank to the bottom of the sea. Screaming passengers fell from the deck or from lowering lifeboats. Some saved themselves on bits of flotsam, but in all, 42 people were lost. The Blunt Reef Lightship did not learn immediately about the disaster. The Humboldt Bay's Coast Guard Station did not yet have a telegraph, but a midnight phone call from Portland sent a rescue boat off to join other ships trying to save survivors. The 20th century added a great many names to the list of area shipwrecks. In March of 1907, the passenger steamer Corona, sailing from San Francisco, wrecked on our bay's north jetty due to confused steering directions. Only one fatality was recorded, but the rescue attempts drew flocks of thrill-seeking observers by ferry from across the bay. By this time, many people owned cameras and recorded the event. Even today, rusted remains of the corona are visible in the sands of the North Spit. Ten years later, privately owned cameras were even more prevalent, and the area's most spectacular double wreck was captured in many photos. In December of 1916, international tensions were rising, and three newly built U.S. submarines set off on a tour of West Coast ports. In heavy fog, on December 15th, submarine H-3, the Garfish, mistook the stack light on a Samoa lumber mill for its minder ship at the bay entrance. Confidently, it headed for the light, only to run aground off Samoa. Children walking to school reported that they saw a beached whale, but when investigation revealed the truth, cables were fired off to the Navy. Through the efforts of local residents, the sailors were saved, but the Navy scorned local low-tech suggestions on how to salvage the sub. Instead, the Navy sent the cruiser USS Milwaukee to pull the H-3 back to sea. Among high waves, the cables broke, 
and the Milwaukee was itself beached. Despite stormy conditions, the crew and the ship's mascots were brought ashore by lifeboats and a breeches buoy, and again local residents pitched in to feed and house the refugees. The local lumberman's original plan was invoked, and Mercer Fraser, a local construction company, hauled the H3 on log rollers over the spit to the bay from where it headed back to San Francisco. Salvaging the Milwaukee proved a bigger task. A pier was built to the deck, and a little town of salvage workers was constructed amid the dunes. Much of value was removed, but for years afterwards, locals used the ship's remains as a playground and a souvenir trove. During World War II, more scrap metal was salvaged for the war effort. Today, a roadside monument marks the location. At very low tides, pier posts and a few metal plates can still be seen poking through the surf like rusty shark fins. The list of maritime disasters around our bay is long and will probably continue to grow. For centuries, people have lived along and depended on this stretch of ocean and the inlet now known as Humboldt Bay. But despite modern technology, nature still often dominates. With climate change, sea level rise, and nuclear waste from a decommissioned power plant now stored on an earthquake fault, future historians may well have new disasters to record. What we know today as Humboldt Bay was, for centuries, home to the Weot people. They called the bay Ouija. Its waters and surrounding woods and marshlands sustained the Weot people with abundant fish, shellfish, and game. When Euro-Americans began settling here in the 1850s, the bay's resources became extensively exploited. Initially, the new settlers from eastern states and from countries around the world, developed the area as an access point to the Trinity and Klamath River gold fields. Hopeful gold seekers set off east from here, while entrepreneurs and farmers supplied their needs through pack trains. The gold boom, however, was short-lived. Many disappointed prospectors returned to the bay and sought to make a living here by exploiting different local resources. The first of these was timber. Initially, the forests of redwood, pine, and fir trees reached almost to the bay shore. Soon, lumber and shingle mills sprang up around the bay. Thousands found employment in the burgeoning timber industry, again coming from many states and countries. The lumber barons who owned the operations built elegant wooden homes. Those who were gaining wealth from other sources in this prospering community followed suit. Lumber shipments from Humboldt Bay contributed to building booms throughout California and as far away as Latin America and Australia. After the devastating earthquake of 1906, Humboldt Lumber did much to rebuild San Francisco. As forests were pushed further back from the bay, new techniques were needed to harvest and transport the timber. Steam engines and rail lines replaced ox and horse teams, and shipping the wood products out of the area became another major industry. This required ships. It was soon evident that the abundant timber was useful for more than just building things on land. Shipbuilding enterprises appeared around both sides of the bay, producing sailing ships and then steamers. These vessels were not just for transporting lumber, but also supplied many maritime needs around the world. Here was another boon for the growing local Euro-American labor force. As the 20th century advanced, the demand for wooden ships declined. With World War II, 
the shipbuilding briefly returned to Humboldt as the Chicago Bridge and Iron Company built floating steel dry docks on the bay. This employed many men and women and led to an additional building boom to house the workers. Just as the Weot people had, the settlers also used the food resources of the bay and adjacent areas. Potatoes, apples, and other crops were grown in the area and shipped out. Fishing became a major industry. By the mid-20th century, the bay bristled with docks for fishing boats, both commercial and recreational. Crabs, oysters, mussels, and other species were featured in local restaurants and, canned or fresh, were soon enjoyed around the world. Processing plants for fish and shellfish provided an additional source of employment. During the first century of Euro-American settlement here, whaling was another ocean-based industry. Whale meat was valued for food and fertilizer, and whale oil was essential for fuel, lighting, and soap making. The whale processing plant at Fields Landing, though decried by neighbors for its foul odor, continued into the 1950s and was the last such plant in the continental United States. Gradually, the area's dependence on exploiting natural resources, gold, timber, and marine, declined. At the same time, the Humboldt Bay area became less isolated. Initially, roads leading here were long and rough, and the often hazardous sea transportation prevailed. However, rail connection to the San Francisco area was completed in 1914. Around the same time, automobiles were becoming available and paved highways finally reached us. A resulting economic development was tourism. Visitors began to come here to enjoy our beautiful bay, abundant fishing, rugged coastline, and preserved redwood forests. The Victorian era redwood homes became a historic attraction. As a result, businesses providing accommodations, dining, excursions, and souvenirs prospered. And in a recent development, gargantuan cruise ships bring visitors from around the world to appreciate the beauty, opportunities, and history of Humboldt Bay. There was an additional offshoot of the transportation improvement into the Humboldt area. Not only could tourists come here, so could movie companies. Beginning in the early 20th century, crews came from Hollywood to film productions. They used Humboldt to take us to other planets, as in Star Wars, or to dinosaur-teeming forests, as in Jurassic Park. Several filmed versions of the book Valley of the Giants, which told a slightly fictionalized story of lumber barons and the redwood industry. Whether through film, tourism, museums, or historical archives, the history of discoveries, disasters, and development around Humboldt Bay is one we all now share. begin now. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, I'm uh, Hotwatlo Nook Marnie Atkins, Yil Weat, Yil Sulatlak, Jarujiji Dadadali. My name is Marnie. Uh, I'm a Sulatlak person, a Sulatlak speaker. I'm a Weat person, and um, I'm from Jarujiji, which is now known as Eureka. But that does not mean that's what the word means. It means a place to uh, rest. So if you imagine going from South Bay to North Bay, 
It's a nice flat place to kind of pull in your canoe and sit down and take a break before you continue on your journey. Um, I would like to introduce to you Dr. Cheryl Seidner. We are elder and culture knowledge bearer, um, former ch tribal chairperson and current cultural liaison and advisor to the Wiat tribe. Alderon Laird, advocate ally and supporter of Wigi and related waterways. And uh, Ted Hernandez, tribal historic preservation officer, NAGPRA coordinator, dance leader, and current tribal chairperson of the Wiat tribe. Um, I just would like to, um, each, if each one of you, if I, Pleased to add to this introduction. I would appreciate it. She was just showing off what she can say, and we are. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. Thank you. <laughs> Do you want to say anything else about your introduction? <laughs> Sassy. <laughs> Miss Sassy. I'm sorry, Dr. Seidner. <laughs> Good thing I knew you. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, uh, as I used to tell students all the time, I know where you live and work, so be careful. It's true. It's, it's a pleasure. I don't have any more things behind my name other than Lacey owns me, which is my dog, <laughs> who is sitting in a car crying. Aww. But uh, it's great to be here to see all the bright shining faces out there and smiles what I can see of you <laughs> I, I, it's a pleasure to be here I guess I would say that uh, as a newcomer I've only been here uh, for about 45 years and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, but this is my home and I um, enjoy and love uh, the time that I've spent on we and I look forward to many more years of exploring its shorelines. And so, Well, like Cheryl says, um, welcome to We Are Country and welcome to our beautiful land that we sit on and live on. And we welcome you all into our families and our We Are Tribe. And I'm also glad to say that Cheryl and Marnie are here, so that means that that's talking for me, <laughs> which is good. We'll see. <laughs> Okay, thank you all. Don't get too comfortable. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to call on Ted a lot. <laughs> well, I think um, I'd like to start with um, uh, Cheryl, if you will, any kind of remembrances or memories of um, of the the timber industry. I know that uh, your father was a logger, and um, I just wonder, you know, we, we just watched how how significant an impact the timber industry was on this area, and I just wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Well, I want to address something that was in the film um, before we answer your question. I want you to remember that the bay is Wigi. It's a hard G, Wigi. And... Um, I thought it was great, uh, whoever put it all together, I saw all the names on there. I thought it was, a, you did a great job, thank you. As for the timber industry, my father was a logger and he logged for decades. And sadly and unfortunately, he was killed when he was 52 in, when he was falling a log or a tree. And um, we miss him greatly. And one of the things she had asked me, what do I remember about him being a logger? What I remember most of his dedication to making sure things were running right on his, whether it was his car or his motor for his uh, chainsaw, it was his six-foot bars. And you guys all know what those are, right? Those long things. And my great uncle, we were down on the Eagle River, and he said, I'm tired. You need to start cutting. I said, what? He said, yeah. So he handed me the chainsaw. And I just kind of looked at it. And the bar was only about this long. I said, I've never run a chainsaw in my life. Well, your dad's a faller. 
And what does that mean? <laughs> My mother was a flare, but I don't fillet fish either. <laughs> and so he said, well, you do it this way. So he taught me how to do it. And after we, I got done cutting up this huge log, log, and he said, you never used the chainsaw before? I says, no. Uh, he says, you got it in your blood <laughs> from your dad. <laughs> The other memory I have of my father was being in the garage and having the vice grip mounted on this great big uh, table that he had built into the wall and everything and mounted this vice grip and put on there his uh, chain. So with every tooth, he would make it sharper and he would undo it and put, put the next one up. I could stand here and watch him do that all day, just like I would watch my mom fillet fish for the Eureka Fisheries. She was like poetry in motion, and Dad was the same. Every movement, there was a reason for that movement, and to move that chain one link at a time. Never counted how many links are on that six foot chain or for that bar so it had to be six foot six foot and four or six inches around the ends and i remember him coming home do you all know what a crummy is yeah. oh good how about the young people do you know what a crummy is <laughs> ask the old people in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a Someone drives up an old car, and it has a, a back seat that could seat about four or five people, and then a car and, and driver and maybe two people in the front. And it was just an odd-looking piece of machinery. And they would come and pick him up in the morning, and then they'd go off and he'd, they'd bring him back. And my recollection is that he'd have his cork boots over his shoulder, his tin hat on, and his lunch bucket. And I always run out to meet him, and I grab his lunch bucket. Well, he'd hand it to me, and I grab it, and I open it up, because he always had a piece of candy in there for me, a little hard candy, root beer. They look like little barrels and inside, and, and I got to make him his lunch almost the night before, and he was a great dad. What an opportunity we had to, <clears throat> excuse me, to have him in our household every, almost every night. Sometimes he would be gone for maybe two weeks at a time because he would be camping where he would be falling a tree, and then he would come home for a few days and then he would be gone. Those are my recollections of a logger, and Plus that, he'd come home, on the, if he was there for a couple of weeks at a time, he would be the coach for um, the Babe Ruth baseball team. And he coached, oh, hundreds of kids. And you know, some of them were my sister's ages, and then when they got older, then the younger ones who were my age. So I had seen all these guys, and I used to, and he'd be tired. He'd be working all day in the woods, and he'd come back, get his old Jeep Willie, pile the boys in there, and off they go practice. And after that, they'd pile in there, and they, he'd take them down to the little grocery store and buy them a soda or an ice cream cone. And he did this all on his own, as a lot of coaches today don't get paid for that. They, their payment is being with those kids those boys and those girls to give them good leadership skills and build those skills. But that's what I remember of my dad as a logger and a community person. He was my hero, 64 flood. They wanted somebody to get in a boat and go and help people off the roofs of their houses. And and somebody said, only a stupid person would do that. And Dad said, I guess that's me. And he put his foot into the boat. Off 
he and two Coast Guard men went out on Eel River, uh, Eel River Bottoms, Lolita Bottoms, and took people off the roofs of their houses and things. And there was one lady who said, oh, just leave me. I'm too fat, I'm too old, I'll just go out with my house. And dad says, no, that's why we're here. He would, goes over there and picks her up like she was just a two by four, <laughs> picks her up, puts her in a boat, and takes her to safety. Her nephew, a few decades later, he says, you, are you related to Bill Seidner? I says, that's my dad. And so he relays the story to me. And I says, yes, I know that story. And that, that was pretty cool. That was the kind of community person he was, not just to his own little Native American community, but to the greater Humboldt County community. Played baseball, had an opportunity to play in the major leagues, but he turned it down because he had a wife and children to feed. And back then, you didn't get millions of dollars to throw out one person. And that's a long story. You don't need to hear any more. If you have any more questions about my dad, I'd be more than happy to tell you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Alderon, do you have any thoughts on the films? Or Because I have questions. If you don't, do you want to? Yeah, I have one. Um, is that uh, the film didn't really draw attention to the fact that um, starting in the 1890s, there was a huge land speculation movement on the bay and they started diking off the salt marsh of Humboldt Bay and they would uh, build a, essentially a dirt berm at the edge of the salt marsh and the mud flat and they ended up uh, cutting off 40 percent of the bay's footprint just diking this area off uh, and 90 percent of all the salt marsh on Humboldt Bay was lost and that was a huge giant impact to Humboldt Bay, its ecosystem, how it functioned. Um, and the reason they did that is it was land speculation. It was trying to clear redwoods and raise agricultural crops amongst the stumps was not easy. And diking off salt marsh and letting the rains wash the salt away, and you ended up with a nice flat arable soil that only cost you a dollar and a quarter an acre, and you could turn around and sell it for 600 was a good deal for a land speculator. And so there was thousands of acres of salt marsh became pasture. And, um, and I think that, you know, that was a, besides the logging and the clear cutting of all the old growth redwood, that was one of the biggest changes that was done to the physical environment of uh, Humboldt Bay. Do you think that would be considered uh, maybe a Disaster. More recent disaster, you know, it could be included in as a potential I think impact it, or disaster on the bay eventually, or what do you it, think? Well, it was a disaster when they cut off all of that salt marsh, you know, that, that was uh, valuable habitat, you know, for the bay. Um, and what they did is they essentially set us up. We inherited a historical legacy of 41 miles of earthen dikes that uh, keep about seven to 8,000 acres former tidelands from being inundated by salt water, um, which in and of itself, you know, you could justify it. There wasn't a lot of agricultural endeavor up here. It was all redwood forest. But what we've done is we've constructed all of our critical utility infrastructure and our critical transportation infrastructure, Highway 101, our uh, underground gas lines, our municipal water lines, sewer lines, are all located on those dike former tidelands. And there's no uh, Humble Bay Dike District that's maintaining them. They're owned by about <laughs> 170 different property owners. Um, it's up to them to maintain them. Um, and those dikes, um, if, they're, if they're breached, you know, if they're overtopped during a king tide and they break, um, even on the front side of the dikes, they might rock them, but they don't rock the back side of the dike. And so if the water goes over the top, it erodes the back, it breaches it. In those lands, the former salt marsh becomes part of the bay the very next day, the very next high tide, the water will all go in. And so all those 41 miles are just sitting there waiting to breach. And, um, and that's not even taken into account sea level rise. Mm -hmm. And so under today's conditions, 
we could lose 7,000 acres of former tidelands, which would be great for Wiggy. You know, the bay would re uh, reclaim its stolen salt marsh, but it wouldn't be good for Highway 101. And it wouldn't be good for us using it. It wouldn't be good for the water lines, you know, that go to Eureka and things like that. So I think that that was um, a disaster to the bay uh, in its natural condition. And I think it's setting us up for a future a disaster in, you know, in the next big storm where they breach. May I ask you a question? Yes. May I ask you a yes. question? <laughs> Thank you. Um, when the dikes were brought in, who paid for those dikes? Was it the landowners or was it the government? It was land, the land speculators. They, what they did is, in the 1850s, when the, um, you know, when the area was invaded by the Euro-Americans, they wanted the property. In order to own property, you have to have a deed. To have a deed, you need a map that describes the property. So the U.S. Survey General uh, surveyed all of the Humboldt Bay region and created townships. And when they mapped Humboldt Bay, they identified all the salt marsh, and they left that outside of the area that you could homestead. Uh, you could homestead the upper uh, upland areas. Well, in 1890, some, for some reason, they decided to remap Humboldt Bay, and, uh, and the salt marsh got changed to something called swamp and overflowed lands. It was no longer called salt marsh. And the reason why, I think, is that the state wouldn't allow you to sell uh, salt marsh. It was part of the bay. It was public trust lands. Swamp and overflowed lands, uh, pursuant to the Arkansas Act of 1852, allows the state to sell those wetlands. They're essentially floodplains along rivers is what they were, swamp and overflow lands, like in Louisiana and on the Mississippi. Well, they wanted to change the salt marsh to swamp and overflow land so they could buy it from the state of California for a dollar and a quarter. So they bought up the salt marsh. They brought in dredges, a floating dredge. It would dig a ditch and the water would fill up the ditch and they would float and they would just keep digging the ditch taking all the dirt and piling it on the edge of the salt marsh right at the boundary of the mudflat, and they built up a berm or a dam. And then when they got all the way you know, to an upland area and they tied in the dike, uh, they'd have to put a tide gate in it. Now they had this land that was, you know, was arable. As soon as uh, the salt washed out of it, you could plow it. There was no stumps. And they turned around and sold it for over $600 an acre. And they didn't want to farm it. They just wanted to create the land, sell it to somebody else, let somebody else do the hard work of farming. So it was private individuals that did it. So whoever bought it would have to upkeep. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. In perpetuity. If you want your land not to be covered by salt water, you know, you need to maintain the dikes, uh, you need to maintain the tide gates. And what's happened is, is that the original salt marsh was, you know, really thick with vegetation and roots. Well, all the vegetation and the roots died off and they oxidized and the ground actually compacted and sunk. So now the tidelands, uh, the former tidelands behind the dikes, if you stand on a dike, are lower than the salt marsh <coughs> on the bay side of the dike. They've dropped about one to three feet. And so now they're closer to the groundwater. And so uh, if the sea level rise continues, that will push up the groundwater and all of those areas will become open water, freshwater open water ponds. <coughs> Even if they spend the millions of dollars it takes to maintain the dikes, uh, they're gonna, we're going to lose those agricultural lands. Their, their time is up it's in the next couple of decades. Thank you. Um, Ted, do you have any comments, or can I ask you a question? What do you want? <laughs> Dealer's choice. I'm not going to ask a question. Okay. I don't think I can get top okay. these <laughs> Well, um, as you know, the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the tribe, you review a lot of projects, a lot, a lot of projects, developments that happen in and around Wiki in our ancestral lands. Um, but specifically, um, I'm just wondering, um, you don't, you know, you don't have to name specific projects, but in your experience and in your, your general oversight, what do you think um, of these ongoing projects that are happening on Wiki, do you think that they um, will impact or continue to impact? Um, you know, what might those outcomes be um, coupled with the films that we watch today? And yeah. Yeah. 
No, um, that's question. actually a good question because we are working on a couple of projects that are on Wiggy. And, you know, my job as a travel historic preservation officer is to make sure that our cultural sites, our village sites are still protected, which they weren't protected back in the early 1900s. You know, we had a, a village site that was pretty much shoved into the, the Mad River, it's the slough of the Mad River, and, you know, that village is no longer there, but it is still there because at that time we had nobody to monitor the sites, protect the sites, but now today, you know, the tribes have monitors and tip officers to be able to predict these sites. So if there is a project that's happening on the bay, then my department will look into it. And if we come to find out that there is a sacred site there or a cultural site, so let me be like a cultural site. Everything to me is sacred because we are a country is sacred to me. So that's why I say sacred. But if it's a cultural site, and I know it's there, then I'm gonna do what's in my powers to protect this site, keep the site protected. And if it may stop something from being built, I'm sorry, but so be it. It needs to be protected because that's where our people are from. That's where our ancestors are from. It's from Wiggy. And that's my job is to make sure it stays safe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, Cheryl, I, you, you know, Ted mentioned sacred, uh, ceremonial, cultural sites. Um, do you have any, would you like to expand upon that and, you know, historically how we got people uh, lived and, and uh, live, I like to say lived in reciprocal relationship with the land, with Wiki, with Batuat and Ikshari. And, uh, do you have any comments um, to expand upon there? Oh, I got a lot of comments. <laughs> <laughs> Growing up on the old reservation, Table Bluff, we just lived like everybody else lived. Got to go to work, put a garden in, um, go gather. Dad and my brother would bring back the venison, eels, abalone, mussels, clams, salmon, surfish. And that's what we ate. And it was always good, always wonderful. Never talked about the ceremonies that would have happened had we been not taken from our land in 1860. I learned about the 1860 massacre from my mom and dad, who told me, you know, well, mom, especially mom, because it was her, her family was on the island, and her great grandfather was the head man, and it was her grandfather who was the baby found on Indian Island, which was called at that time Indian Island. Today it's called Tuluat. I was gonna say something else. <laughs> Good thing she's sitting next to me. Um, Tuluat, and so a lot of that went underground. We never had coming of age ceremonies for young girls, becoming young women. We didn't have ceremonies for the young boys coming to young men all that went away because, you know, as my grandfather said, is that when he spoke the language, he would get hit with a ruler. And you don't speak it, you speak English. My boss, she was a director at Humboldt State, and one time I, we, we had a lot of students who were ESL, English as a second language, and I, and I happened to pipe up one day, and I says, well, I'm ESL. And she looked at me, what do you mean? I said, English is my second language. No, it's not. You were born speaking English. I says, no, I spoke like my ancestors, Shirelak, means weat. We spoke weat. You didn't speak it, your parents didn't speak it. I said, that's true, but it's in my DNA. I, let's, let's talk about that for a little while. And I, I was talking to, in front, 
in front of a lot of students who were ESL, and, and they all clapped. <laughs> <laughs> and I marvel at people who can speak more than one language. I can just barely speak English. And sometimes that's kind of difficult. But we, I think it was just a normal thing. We, mom and dad worked. Dad worked in the trees, in the logging industry. Mother worked in the fisheries. She was a flare. And we just lived off the land. We didn't expect anybody to help us. We did what we could to help ourselves. Put in a big garden every year. Mother canned everything that she could get her hands on, whether it was um, deer meat or salmon or anything, or vegetables, fruits. We did it just like everybody else was doing it. It was a good life. Well, hunting was my, my dad and my brother in an old cheap willy bouncing all over down, and I mean bouncing, <laughs> uh, shooting jackrabbit in cottontail and at night. And here's this little six-year-old kid just bopping along with, with, mom, uh, with dad and my brother, and we would have rabbit stew you know, or fried rabbit or ducks or mallards, um, coots, which is uh, mud hens, and all these different kind of things is what I grew up with. And it, and you couldn't have had a better life. And, uh, make uh, dry beans, go out there next after the season was over, pick up all the dry beans and having to get all the beans out of the pods and everything. It was a lot of fun because it never meant like it was work because we were always together. We played together, we worked together. My mom, my dad, and my brother, my three sisters and I. Of course, it's Cheryl go do this, Cheryl go do that, because I was the youngest. And it's still that way. And I'm going to be 73 this summer, and it's still <laughs> Cheryl do this, Cheryl do that. But it's, it's because we're a family, we do it together. And when we had, especially a teenage problem, and Mother would say, that's enough. Okay. You, you slink back down. You don't rear that teenage head up again until you behaved yourself and learned how to deal with people and be with people. It, it was a good time, and we learned how to talk to one another and learned how to work on cars, work on small motors, and help dig a well. I didn't, I just helped supervise. <laughs> and all those different things that a lot of young people don't get to do today because they don't have that opportunity. We went eeling, we learned how to eel, learn how to clean them, learn how to smoke them and cook them. And I never cleaned an eel until I was about 20 some odd years old. My mother says, you gotta get out here and say, all my sisters learned how to, I was the go-to kid. You go do this, you go do that. So I never had to learn how to do that. And so my mother taught me how to clean an eel and then you take a razor blade, because you know they're round like this, so you cut them down here and you gotta make them lay flat. So you gotta take a razor blade and cut all the muscle so that they would, instead of being like this, they would lay flat. <laughs> My mother held mine up, she says, yours look like lace, because you could <laughs> see right through it, because you're not supposed to cut through the skin. Well, I was doing a double duty. But it was, it was fun and it was always good to be doing, and we camp together, we go on trips together, and one day we'd wake up and Daddy would come and bang on the pot lid with a metal spoon or a wooden spoon and get us up and say, get in the car, we're going. And he had already 
quick breakfast, so we sit down for breakfast. We get in the car. Or where are we going? We don't know. Mom had made a big picnic basket full of food, and off we'd go. And if I could do that today, that's what we would be doing. Just jump in the car and let's just go. Who, where do we go? We don't know. It all depends when we got hungry and we stopped the car. <laughs> and that's the way I was brought up, and that's the way I enjoy it. And, you know, I moved to San Francisco in 68 when I graduated from high school. And my mama gave, gave me a talk, and she said, I want you to know, never allow anyone to tell you who you are. You are Bill and Loretta Seidner's daughter. That's all you need to know, and that you're we at. Nobody can take those two things away from you. And that's what got me through San Francisco, because I got there when it was Haight-Ashbury Flower Child <laughs> Movement, burning of the bras, burning of San Francisco State, and burning of Alcatraz. So I was there on the peripheral watching all these people go crazy. And I standing around looking like this, what are they doing, you know? And it was, it was an education, and it was really fun. I enjoyed it, just watching everybody go crazy. But that was my growing up years as being a we out person. And and I heard things people said, and I wonder if they knew what they were saying or how they sounded. One person came up to me. She was the, my big boss. He was a doctor of where I was working at. He was a PhD. And he, his wife came up to me, and she says, I wanted you to know that one of my best friends was Indian. You know how cliche that sounds? <laughs> I was only 18, 19 years old, and I thought I was pretty bad then. <laughs> and things that we say to one another sometimes is just silly. Just accept me as your friend. Mm -hmm. I don't have to be Indian. I don't have to be we are, but that's just who I am. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> No, I, I love hearing Cheryl's stories. Um, you know, Cheryl is like my mom away from mom because her and my mother were best friends growing up. So I have a mom when I came here. But the best, you know, I, I was just thinking about the films. And one thing I saw about the films is how the We Out people came out to help the people that were stranded from these boat wrecks. And later on, we were massacred because... They wanted more land. They wanted more, you know, the timber, the, the fish, the gold. And I want people to understand, because this is what show taught me, was that being we out is that you take somebody into your house, you feed them, you give them food, you give them a place to sleep, you give them water if they're thirsty. And if they wish to stay, then they're allowed to stay. And we did this for these people on these boats. We allowed them. But later on, greed grew in, and they wanted more. And they had to take the Wiats out. And I'm, you know, it's a little bit about the history. And I'm glad these films were made because it's part of history. True history. This is what we're telling about true history now. Because a lot of things that we learn in school are not told the truth about the history of the Native community. And to see, you know, to hear that we are warring people. The Wiats were never warring people. We we're very peaceful, loving people. But they had to make it out that way, that we were a warring tribe, that we were attacking them. No, we brought them in, and we fed them, and we helped, brought them back to health. <clears throat> but they don't want that part of the history being told, because the people who learn about the history of, these, of the bad things that the government did to the indigenous communities, it would make them look bad through their history. Because here we are, we go out to save other countries and their people, but we don't tell about our history. And that's why I'm glad that I'm sitting here with Elder Ron and Cheryl, especially Cheryl, my elder, because history is going to be told. No matter if people want to hear the true history, it's still going to be told because we have the younger generation that are going to school and learning how to tell the true history. And one day the true history will be in our history books and people will understand why the indigenous people do what we do. And like Elder Ron said, when they built these dikes, they shouldn't have been built. Those, that waterway is set for a certain reason. And if... We put things there, man-made, 
Creators are gonna come back and say, this shouldn't be here, I'm gonna take it out. And then you're gonna learn from that lesson on. You know, that's why we have climate control now, climate change now is because things are happening because we did things that we shouldn't have done in the past. And now government agencies are coming to tribes and saying, how do we fix this? Well, in the first place, you should have never done it that way. Second, we'll work together as a community and we'll fix it together. And that's what we're doing now as, as a tribal nation and governments, we're working together to fix the problems before they get worse. Because I was always thinking this, why change something when something bad is gonna happen? And usually when you change the natural, natural area, the natural landscape, something bad happens. So we need to go back and fix that. And you know, these films were very touching in some parts that I watched, and especially when you know, they talked about the massacre. And they talked about the Mad River incident when the, the people you know, went mad, but in we, uh, we call it Balawat, and it doesn't mean mad. It means flowing stream, and that stream is constantly flowing. Eel River, you know, we are known as for Weat. That's our name for that river. That's where my family comes from as well, from the village of the Weat River and as well from Tulawat. So we have to tell the true history. We have to make sure that people understand why we do the things as Weat people or any indigenous community is why we do the things that we do today is because we want to make sure that our area is protected not just for our seven generations, but for every one seven generation that sits here with us today. to um, ask Alderon, you, you dropped in, you know, your little, your little nugget and, you know, what, a worm, you dropped a worm in the water and so I'm going to try to catch it right now um, about uh, sea level rise and um, this diking on Wiyi. Um, can these changes be undone, or can these changes are you know is it could it be beyond our repair? Um, yeah, what are your what are your thoughts on that? How might we restore? How might we work together? As Ted said, as Cheryl said, um, to reclaim these spaces if they can be reclaimed. They can be reclaimed. Um. When they started diking in 1890s, you know, uh, they set something in motion, um, and they had no idea how it was really going to end. And we're at the end game for those lands. You know, the you may not know this, but because of the tectonic subsidence, Humboldt Bay has the highest rate of sea level rise on the entire West Coast. Over the last century, the water's risen 18 inches. It means those dikes are a foot and a half lower than they were when they built them in the 1890s. They're right now at a threshold. The average dike is about a 10-foot elevation, uh, the 10-foot contour. Our average king tide is almost nine feet. And so uh, in 2005, we had a king tide and we had a storm with wind waves. And the water got to a record nine and a half feet. And the governor declared a state of disaster on Humboldt Bay. That wasn't even a foot higher than our average king tide. and so. When we think about sea level rise on Humboldt Bay, we're not thinking about 100 years out. We're talking about one in two and three decades. As the water rises to that 10-foot elevation, with one foot of sea level rise, our king tides will be at that threshold. Uh, as it crosses that threshold, half of the 50% of the 41 miles of dikes will be overtopped with just uh, two feet of sea level rise. And so all of those seven to 8,000 acres are gonna to start to be reclaimed by Wigi. You know, as each accident happens and we breach one area, there's 24 separate dike uh, hydrologic units around the bay. So all you need is one breach in a, in a shoreline and all the land behind that common shoreline will become tidal again, become part of the bay. And so, uh, that's starting to happen now, and between now, the state's projection for three feet or one meter of sea level rise is 2060. 
So between, over the next 40 years, all of these dikes are gonna be overtopped. Those seven to 8,000 acres uh, will be reconnected with the bay. They'll be flooded on a daily basis with high tides and low tides. And they'll start uh, restoring themselves. They'll rebuild back some salt marsh. But as I mentioned earlier, the ground has sunk almost one to three feet. So we'll get a lot more mudflat than we will salt marsh um, with the, when these dikes are overtopped. And so we don't have to wait for that to happen. We can make it happen. We can go out and we can breach the dikes. Down on the Humboldt Bay National Wildlife Refuge, an area called White Slough, uh, we decided that the uh, good way to restore the salt marsh in that area was to, uh, to essentially lower the elevation of the dikes and let the high tides flow over the top of them and breach the dikes so the land behind the dikes became fully tidal again. And they brought in a lot of dirt, almost a quarter of a million yards of dirt to raise the elevation. So now it's growing salt marsh. And it's only been there for about a year, year and a half, or two years. We don't have a lot of dirt to come in and fill up seven to 8,000 acres of former land. So as those areas are breached, uh, they, the outer fringes will be salt marsh and the inner area would be mud flat. But as sea level continues to rise, based on the three-dimensional maps that have been made of the bay. When we have, say, 10 feet of sea level rise, that's three meters, that's projected to happen by 2120, 100 years from now. When we go from two meters of sea level rise to three meters of sea level rise, Badawat starts flowing back into Humboldt Bay. And we'll have a new source of sediment. We won't have to truck it, it'll flow in with the river. We'll probably start growing huge salt marsh plains on the Mad River bottom, or the Bottawak bottom, and it'll spread out into Arcata Bay. And so we'll have a new ecosystem uh, that's expanding. Uh, Arcata Bay will probably get shallower. Things are gonna change with sea level rise, but I don't think all the changes are negative. I think there's a lot of opportunities to reestablish valuable ecosystems that we lost, that we intentionally took away without knowing what we were doing. And so, Hopefully we have the wisdom to let the bay do what it wants to do. We can't stop sea level rise. It's gonna keep happening for centuries. We need to adapt to it and, uh, and see the opportunities and uh, just take our time. We had a lot of canoes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just gonna wrap up um, kind of what we've you know, talked about here. Um, say some words, and then uh, we'd like to open it up to you all. If you have questions of anybody on the panel, we'd love to know. Um, so before we do that, I just want to echo what Alderon said. Um, you know, uh, sea level rise is a very scary thing, especially for people who are living on coastal areas and islands, right? Where are they going to go? they will be sea level rise refugees. And we have to figure out how to care for them, support them, help them find safe places to live. We I am Hotwatlo Ritnuk Marni Atkins, Yil Wiat, Yil Sulatlak, Jarujiji Dadadali. My name is Marnie. Uh, I'm a Sulatlak person, a Sulatlak speaker. I'm a Wiyat person. And um, I'm from Jarujiji, which is now known as Eureka. But that does not mean that's what the word means. Okay? It means a place to uh, rest. So if you imagine going from South Bay to North Bay, it's a nice flat place to kind of pull in your canoe and sit down and take a break before you continue on your journey. Um, I would like to introduce to you Dr. Cheryl Seidner. We are elder and culture knowledge bearer, um, former ch tribal chairperson and current cultural liaison and advisor to the Wiat tribe. Alderon Laird, advocate ally and supporter of Wigi and related waterways. And uh, Ted Hernandez, tribal historic preservation officer, NAGPRA coordinator, dance leader and current tribal chairperson of the Wiat tribe. Um, I just would like to, um, each, if each one of you, if I please to add to this introduction, I would appreciate it. 
She was just showing off what she can say, and we are. <laughs> Good job. Thank you. <laughs> Do you want to say anything else about your introduction? <laughs> Sassy. <laughs> Miss Sassy. I'm sorry, Dr. Seidner. <laughs> Good thing I knew you. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, uh, as I used to tell students all the time, I know where you live and work, so be careful. It's true. It's, it's a pleasure. I don't have any more things behind my name other than Lacey owns me, which is my dog, who is sitting in a car crying. Aww. But uh, it's great to be here to see all the bright, shining faces out there and smiles, what I can see of you. <laughs> I, I, it's a pleasure to be here. I guess I would say that uh, as a newcomer, I've only been here uh, for about 45 years. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, but this is my home. And I um, enjoy and love uh, the time that I've spent on WIGI. And I look forward to many more years of exploring its shorelines. And so, Well, like Cheryl says, um, welcome to WIGI country and welcome to our beautiful land that we sit on and live on. And we welcome you all into our families and our WIGI tribe. And I'm also glad to say that Cheryl and Marnie are here, so that means that that's talking for me, <laughs> which is good. We'll see. <laughs> okay, thank you all. Don't get too comfortable. Yeah, down there. <laughs> I'm going to call on Ted a lot. <laughs> well, I think um, I'd like to start with um, uh, Cheryl, if you will, any kind of remembrances or memories of. Um, of the, the timber industry. I know that uh, your father was a logger and um, I just wonder, you know, we, we just watched how, how significant an impact the timber industry was on this area and I just wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Well, I want to address something that was in the film um, before we answer your question. I want you to remember that the bay is Wigi. It's a hard G. Wiggy, and um, I thought it was great. Uh, whoever put it all together, I saw all the names on there. I thought it was a, you did a great job. Thank you. As for the timber industry, my father was a logger, and he logged for decades. And sadly and unfortunately, he was killed when he was 52 in when he was falling a log or a tree. And um, we miss him greatly. And one of the things she had asked me, what do I remember about him being a logger? What I remember most of his dedication to making sure things were running right on his, whether it was his car or his motor for his uh, chainsaw. It was his six foot bars. And you guys all know what those are, right? Those long things. And my great uncle, we were down on the Eagle River and he said, I'm tired, you need to start cutting. I says, what? He says, yeah, so he handed me the chainsaw. And I just kind of looked at it, and the bar was only about this long. I says, I've never ran a chainsaw in my life. Well, your dad's a faller. <laughs> and what does that mean? <laughs> my mother was a flare, but I don't fillet fish either. <laughs> and so he said, well, you do it this way. So he taught me how to do it. And after we, I got done cutting up this huge log, log, and he said, you never used the chainsaw before? I says, no. Uh, he says, you got it in your blood <laughs> from your dad. <laughs> the other memory I have of my father was being in the garage and having the vice grip mounted on this great big uh, table that he had built into the wall and everything and mounted this vice grip 
and put on there his uh, chain. So with every tooth, he would make it sharper and he would undo it and put, put the next one up. I could stand here and watch him do that all day, just like I would watch my mom fillet fish for the Eureka Fisheries. She was like poetry in motion and dad was the same. Every movement, there was a reason for that movement and to move that chain one link at a time. Never counted how many links are on that six foot chain or for that bar, so it had to be six foot, six foot, and four or six inches around the ends. And I remember him coming home. Do you all know what a crummy is? Yeah. Oh, good. How about the young people? Do you know what a crummy is? <laughs> Ask the old people in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's uh, someone drives up an old car and it has a, a back seat that could seat about four or five people and then a car and, and driver and maybe two people in the front. And it's just an odd looking piece of machinery and they would come and pick him up in the morning and then they'd go off and he'd, they'd bring him back. And my recollection is that he'd have his cork boots over his shoulder, his tin hat on, and his lunch bucket. And I always run out to meet him, and I grab his lunch bucket. Well, he'd hand it to me, and I'd grab it, and I'd open it up, because he always had a piece of candy in there for me, a little hard candy, root beer. They looked like little barrels. And inside, and and I got to make him his lunch almost the night before, and he was a great dad. What an opportunity we had to <clears throat> excuse me to have him in our household every almost every night. Sometimes he would be gone for maybe two weeks at a time because he would be camping where he would be falling a tree, and then he would come home for a few days, and then he would be gone. Those are my recollections of a logger. And plus that, he'd come home on, if he was there for a couple of weeks at a time, he would be the coach for um, the Babe Ruth baseball team. And he coached, oh, hundreds of kids. And you know, some of them were my sister's ages, and then when they got older, than the younger ones who were my age. So I had seen all these guys and I used to, and he'd be tired. He'd be working all day in the woods and he'd come back, get his old Jeep Willie, pile the boys in there and off they go practice. And after that, they'd pile in there and they, he'd take them down to the little grocery store and buy them a soda or an ice cream cone. And he did this all on his own as a lot of coaches today don't get paid for that. They'd, their payment is being with those kids, those boys and those girls to give them good leadership skills and build those skills. But that's what I remember of my dad as a logger and a community person. He was my hero, 64 flood. They wanted somebody to get in a boat and go and help people off the roofs of their houses. And, and somebody said, only a stupid person would do that. And dad said, I guess that's me. And he put his foot into the boat. Off, He and two Coast Guard men went out on Eel River, um, Eel River Bottoms, Lolita Bottoms, and took people off the roofs of their houses and things. And there was one lady who said, Oh, just leave me. I'm too fat. I'm too old. I'll just go out with my house. And Dad says, no, that's why we're here. He was, goes over there and picks her up like she was just a two-by-four, <laughs> picks her up, puts her in a boat, and takes her to safety. Her nephew, a few decades later, he says, you, are you related to Bill Seidner? I says, that's my dad. And so he relays the story to me. And I says, yes, I know that story. 
And that, that was pretty cool. That was the kind of community person he was, not just to his own little Native American community, but to the greater Humboldt County community. Played baseball, had an opportunity to play in the major leagues, but he turned it down because he had a wife and children to feed. And back then, you didn't get millions of dollars to throw out one person. And that's a long story. You don't need to hear any more. If you have any more questions about my dad, I'd be more than happy to tell you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Alderon, do you have any thoughts on the films? Or Because I have questions. If you don't, do you want to? Yeah, I have one. Um, is that uh, the film didn't really draw attention to the fact that um, starting in the 1890s, there was a huge land speculation movement on the bay and they started diking off the salt marsh of Humble Bay and they would uh, build a, essentially a dirt berm at the edge of the salt marsh and the mud flat and they ended up uh, cutting off 40 percent of the bay's footprint just diking this area off uh, and 90 percent of all the salt marsh on Humble Bay was lost and that was a huge giant impact to Humboldt Bay, its ecosystem, how it functioned. Um, and the reason they did that is it was land speculation. It was trying to clear redwoods and raise agricultural crops amongst the stumps was not easy. And diking off salt marsh and letting the rains wash the salt away, and you ended up with a nice flat, arable soil that only cost you a dollar and a quarter an acre, and you could turn around and sell it for 600 was a good deal for a land speculator. And so there was thousands of acres of salt marsh became pasture. And, um, and I think that, you know, that was a, besides the logging and the clear cutting of all the old growth redwood, that was one of the biggest changes that was done to the physical environment of uh, Humble Bay. Do you think that would be considered uh, maybe a Disaster. More recent disaster, you know, it could be included in as a potential I think impact it, or disaster on the bay eventually, or what do you think? It, well, it was a disaster when they cut off all of that salt marsh, you know, that, that was a valuable habitat, you know, for the bay. Um, and what they did is they essentially set us up. We inherited a historical legacy of 41 miles of earthen dikes that uh, keep about seven to 8,000 acres of former tidelands from being inundated by salt water, um, which in and of itself, you know, you could justify it. There wasn't a lot of agricultural endeavor up here. It was all redwood forest. But what we've done is we've constructed all of our critical utility infrastructure and our critical transportation infrastructure, Highway 101, our uh, underground gas lines, our municipal water lines, sewer lines, are all located on those dike former tidelands. And there's no uh, Humboldt Bay Dike District that's maintaining them. They're owned by about <laughs> 170 different property owners. Um, it's up to them to maintain them. Um, and those dikes, um, if, they're, if they're breached, you know, if they're overtopped during a king tide and they break, um, even on the front side of the dikes, they might rock them, but they don't rock the back side of the dike. And so if the water goes over the top, it erodes the back, it breaches it. In those lands, the former salt marsh becomes part of the bay the very next day, the very next high tide. The water will all go in. And so all those 41 miles are just sitting there waiting to breach. And, um, and that's not even taken into account sea level rise. Mm -hmm. And so under today's conditions, we could lose 7,000 acres of former tide, tide lands which would be great for Wiggy. You know, the bay would re uh, reclaim its stolen salt marsh, but it wouldn't be good for Highway 101. And it wouldn't be good for us using it. It wouldn't be good for the water lines, you know, that go to Eureka and things like that. So I think that that was um, a disaster to the bay uh, in its natural condition. And I think it's setting us up for a future a disaster in, you know, in the next big storm where they breach. May I ask you a question? May I ask you a yeah. question? Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> um, when the dikes were brought in, who paid for those dikes? Was it the landowners or was it the government? It was land, the land speculators. They, what they did is 
In 1850s, when the, um, you know, when the area was invaded by the Euro-Americans, they wanted the property. In order to own property, you have to have a deed. To have a deed, you need a map that describes the property. So the US Survey General uh, surveyed all of the Humboldt Bay region and created townships. And when they mapped Humboldt Bay, they identified all the salt marsh, and they left that outside of the area that you could homestead. Uh, you could homestead the upper uh, upland areas. Well, in 1890, some, for some reason, they decided to remap Humboldt Bay, and, uh, and the salt marsh got changed to something called swamp and overflowed lands. It was no longer called salt marsh. And the reason why, I think, is that the state wouldn't allow you to sell uh, salt marsh. It was part of the bay. It was public trust lands. Swamp and overflowed lands, uh, pursuant to the Arkansas Act of 1852, allows the state to sell those wetlands. They're essentially floodplains along rivers is what they were, swamp and overflow lands, like in Louisiana and on the Mississippi. Well, they wanted to change the salt marsh to swamp and overflow land so they could buy it from the state of California for a dollar and a quarter. So they bought up the salt marsh. They brought in dredges, a floating dredge. It would dig a ditch and the water would fill up the ditch and they would float and they would just keep digging the ditch taking all the dirt and piling it on the edge of the salt marsh right at the boundary of the mudflat, and they built up a berm or a dam. And then when they got all the way you know, to an upland area and they tied in the dike, uh, they'd have to put a tide gate in it. Now they had this land that was, you know, was arable. As soon as uh, the salt washed out of it, you could plow it. There was no stumps. And they turned around and sold it for over $600 an acre. And they didn't want to farm it. They just wanted to create the land, sell it to somebody else, let somebody else do the hard work of farming. So it was private individuals that did it. So whoever bought it would have to upkeep? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. In perpetuity. If you want your land not to be covered by salt water, you know, you need to maintain the dikes, uh, you need to maintain the tide gates. And what's happened is, is that the original salt marsh was, you know, really thick with vegetation and roots. Well, all the vegetation and the roots died off and they oxidized and the ground actually compacted and sunk. So now the tidelands, uh, the former tidelands behind the dikes, if you stand on a dike, are lower than the salt marsh <coughs> on the base side of the dike. They've dropped about one to three feet. And so now they're closer to the groundwater. And so uh, if the sea level rise continues, that will push up the groundwater and all those areas will become open water, freshwater open water ponds. <coughs> Even if they spend the millions of dollars it takes to maintain the dikes, uh, they're gonna, we're gonna lose those agricultural lands. Their, their time is up it's in the next couple of decades. Thank you. Um, Ted, do you have any comments or can I ask you a question? What do you want? <laughs> Dealer's choice. I'm gonna ask a question. Okay. I don't think I can get top okay. <laughs> Well, um, as you know, the tribal historic preservation officer for the tribe, you review a lot of projects, a lot, a lot of projects, developments that happen in and around Wiki in our ancestral lands. Um, but specifically, um, I'm just wondering. Um, you don't, you know, you don't have to name specific projects, but in your experience and in your your general oversight, what do you think? Um, of these ongoing projects that are happening on Wiki, do you think that they um, will impact or continue to impact? Um, you know, what might those outcomes be, um, coupled with the films that we watch today? And yeah, yeah. Water. No, um, a that's question. a good question because we are working on a couple of projects that are on no, Wiki. And you know, my job as a tribal historic preservation officer is to make sure that our cultural sites, our village sites, are still protected, which they weren't protected back in the early 1900s. You know, we had a, a village site that was pretty much shoved into the the Mad River, it's the slough of the Mad River, and you know that village is no longer there, but it is still there because at that time we had nobody to monitor the sites, protect the sites. But now today, you know. The tribes have monitors and tip officers to be able to predict these sites. So if there is a project that's happening on the bay, then my department will look into it. And if we come to find out that there is a sacred site there or a cultural site, so let me back a cultural site. 
everything to me is sacred because we are country is sacred to me. So that's why I say sacred. But if it's a cultural site, and I know it's there, then I'm going to do what's in my powers to protect this site, to keep the site protected. And if it may stop something from being built, I'm sorry, but so be it. It needs to be protected because that's where our people are from. That's where our ancestors are from. It's from Wiggy. And that's my job is to make sure it stays safe. Um, Cheryl, I, you, you know, Ted mentioned sacred, uh, ceremonial, cultural sites. Um, do you have any, would you like to expand upon that and, you know, historically how we are people uh, lived and, and uh, live, I like to say lived in reciprocal relationship with the land, with Wiki, with Batawat and Ikshari. And, uh, do you have any comments um, to expand upon there? Oh, I got a lot of comments. <laughs> <laughs> Growing up on the old reservation, Table Bluff, we just lived like everybody else lived. Got to go to work, put a garden in, um, go gather. Dad and my brother would bring back the venison, eels, abalone, mussels, clams, salmon, surfish. And that's what we ate. And it was always good, always wonderful. Never talked about the ceremonies that would have happened had we been not taken from our land in 1860. I learned about the 1860 massacre from my mom and dad who told me, you know, well, mom, especially mom, because it was her, her family was on the island and her great grandfather was the head man, and it was her grandfather who was the baby found on Indian Island, which was called at that time Indian Island. Today it's called Tuluat. I was gonna say something else. <laughs> Good thing she's sitting next to me. Um, Tuluat, and so a lot of that went underground. We never had coming of age ceremonies for young girls, becoming young women. We didn't have ceremonies for the young boys coming to young men. All that went away because, you know, as my grandfather said, is that when he spoke the language, he would get hit with a ruler. And you don't speak it, you speak English. My boss, she was a director at Humboldt State, and one time I, we, we had a lot of students who were ESL, English as a second language, and I, and I happened to pipe up one day, and I says, well, I'm ESL. And she looked at me, what do you mean? I said, English is my second language. No, it's not. You were born speaking English. I says, no. I spoke like my ancestors, Shirayak means we at. We spoke we at. You didn't speak it, your parents didn't speak it. I said, that's true, but it's in my DNA. I, let's, let's talk about that for a little while. And I, I was talking to, in front, in front of a lot of students who were ESL, and, and they all clapped. <laughs> And I marvel at people who can speak more than one language. I can just barely speak English. And sometimes that's kind of difficult. But we, I think it was just a normal thing. We, mom and dad worked. Dad worked in the trees in the logging industry. Mother worked in the fisheries. She was the flare. And we just lived off the land. We didn't expect anybody to help us. We did what we could to help ourselves. 
put in a big garden every year. Mother canned everything that she could get her hands on, whether it was um, deer meat or salmon or anything, or vegetables, fruits. We did it just like everybody else was doing it. It was a good life. Well, hunting was my, my dad and my brother in an old Jeep Willie, bouncing all over down, and I mean bouncing, <laughs> uh, shooting jackrabbit in cottontail and at night. And here's this little six-year-old kid just bopping along with, with, mom, uh, with dad and my brother. And we would have rabbit stew, you know, or fried rabbit, or ducks, or mallards, um, coots, which is uh, mud hens, and all these different kind of things is what I grew up with. And, and couldn't have had a better life. And, um, make uh, dry beans, go out there next, after the season was over, pick up all the dry beans and having to get all the beans out of the pods and everything. It was a lot of fun because it never meant like it was work because we were always together. We played together, we worked together, my mom, my dad, my brother, my three sisters and I. Of course, it's Cheryl go do this, Cheryl go do that because I was the youngest. And it's still that way. And I'm going to be 73 this summer and it's still <laughs> Cheryl do this, Cheryl do that. But it's... It's because we're a family, we do it together. And when we had, especially a teenage problem, and mother would say, that's enough. Okay. You, you slink back down, you don't rear that teenage head up again until you behaved yourself and learned how to deal with people and be with people. It was a good time, and we learned how to talk to one another and learned how to work on cars, work on small motors, and help dig a well. I didn't. I just helped supervise. <laughs> and. All those different things that a lot of young people don't get to do today because they don't have that opportunity. We went eeling, we learned how to eel, learned how to clean them, learned how to smoke them and cook them. And I never cleaned an eel until I was about 20 some odd years old. My mother said, you gotta get out here and say, all my sisters learned how to, I was the go-to kid. You go do this, you go do that. So I never had to learn how to do that. And so my mother taught me how to clean an eel. And then you take a razor blade, because you know they're round like this. So you cut them down here, and you got to make them lay flat. So you got to take a razor blade and cut all the muscle so that they would, instead of being like this, they would lay flat. <laughs> my mother held mine up. She says, Yours looks like lace, because you could see right through it, because you're not supposed to cut through the skin. Well, I was doing a double duty. But it was, it was fun, and it was always good to be doing, you know, we camp together, we go on trips together, and one day we'd wake up and Daddy would come and bang on the pot lid with a metal spoon or a wooden spoon and get us up and say, Get in the car, we're going. And he had already cooked breakfast, so we sit down for breakfast. We get in the car. Or where are we going? We don't know. Mom had made a big picnic basket full of food, and off we'd go. And if I could do that today, that's what we would be doing. Just jump in the car and let's just go. Who, where do we go? We don't know. It all depends when we got hungry, we stopped the car. <laughs> and that's the way I was brought up. And that's the way I enjoy it. And, you know, I moved to San Francisco in 68 when I graduated from high school. And my mama gave, gave me a talk. And she said, I want you to know, 
Never allow anyone to tell you who you are. You are Bill and Loretta Seidner's daughter. That's all you need to know, and that you're we at. Nobody can take those two things away from you. And that's what got me through San Francisco, because I got there when it was Haight-Ashbury Flower Child Movement, <laughs> burning of the bras, burning of San Francisco State, and burning of Alcatraz. So I was there on the peripheral, watching all these people go crazy. And I standing around looking at this, what are they doing, you know? And it was, it was an education, and it was really fun. I enjoyed it, <laughs> just watching everybody go crazy. <laughs> but that was my growing up years as being a wee up person. And, and I heard things people said, and I wonder if they knew what they were saying or how they sounded. One person came up to me. She was the, my big boss. He was a doctor. I was where I was working at. He was a PhD. And he, his wife came up to me and she says, I wanted you to know that one of my best friends was Indian. You know how cliche that sounds? <laughs> I, I was only 18, 19 years old and I thought I was pretty bad then. <laughs> and things that we say to one another sometimes is just... Silly. Just accept me as your friend. Mm -hmm. I don't have to be Indian. I don't have to be we are, but that's just who I am. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> no, I, I love hearing Cheryl's stories. Um, you know, Cheryl is like my mom away from mom because her and my mother were best friends growing up. So I have a mom when I came here. But the best, you know, I, I was just thinking about the films. And one thing I saw about the films is how the We Are People came out to help the people that were stranded from these boat wrecks. And later on, we were massacred because they wanted more land, they wanted more, you know, the timber, the, the fish, the gold. And I want people to understand, because this is what show taught me was that being we out is that you take somebody into your house, you feed them, you give them food, you give them a place to sleep, you give them water if they're thirsty. And if they wish to stay, then they're allowed to stay. And we did this for these people on these boats. We allowed them. But later on, greed grew in and they wanted more. And they had to take the we outs out. And I'm, you know, it's a little bit about the history. And I'm glad these films were made because it's part of history. True history. This is what we're talking about, true history now. Because a lot of things that we learn in school are not told the truth about the history of the Native community. And to see, you know, to hear that we are warring people. The Wiats were never warring people. We were very peaceful, loving people. But they had to make it out that way, that we are a warring tribe, that we were attacking them. No, we brought them in and we fed them and we helped, brought them back to health. <clears throat> But they don't want that part of the history being told because the people learn about the history of these of the bad things that the government did to the indigenous communities, it would make them look bad through their history. Because here we are, we go out to save other countries and their people, but we don't tell about our history. And that's why I'm glad that I'm sitting here with Elder Ron and Cheryl, especially Cheryl, my elder, because history is gonna be told. No matter if people wanna hear the true history, it's still gonna be told because we have the younger generation that are going to school and learning how to tell the true history. And one day the true history will be in our history books and people will understand why the indigenous people do what we do. And like I said, when they built these dikes, they shouldn't have been built. Those, that waterway is set for a certain reason and if we put things there, man-made, creators are gonna come back and say, this shouldn't be here, I'm gonna take it out. And then you're gonna learn from that lesson on. You know, that's why we have climate control now, climate change now is because Things are happening because we did things that we shouldn't have done in the past. And now government agencies are coming to tribes and saying, how do we fix this? Well, in the first place, you should have never done it that way. Second, we'll work together as a community and we'll fix it together. And that's what we're doing now as, as a tribal nation and governments, we're working together to fix the problems before they get worse. Because I was always thinking this, why change something when something bad is going to happen. And usually when you change the natural 
natural area, the natural landscape, something bad happens. So we need to go back and fix that. And, you know, these films were very touching in some parts that I watched, and especially when, you know, they talked about the massacre. And they talked about the Mad River incident when the, the people, you know, went mad, but, and we, uh, we call it Badawa, and it doesn't mean mad. It means flowing stream, and that stream is constantly flowing. Il River, you know, we are known as for Wiat. That's our name for that river. That's where my family comes from as well, from the village of the Wiat River and also from Tulawat. So we have to tell the true history. We have to make sure that people understand why we do the things as Wiat people or any indigenous community is why we do the things that we do today. It's because we want to make sure that our area is protected not just for our seven generations, but for everyone in the generation that sits here with us today. Um, I wanted to um, ask Alderon, you, you dropped in you know your little your little nugget and you know what a worm you dropped a worm in the water and so I'm gonna try to catch it right now um, about uh, sea level rise and um, this diking on Wiyi um, can these changes be undone or can these changes are you know is it could it be beyond our repair? Um, yeah, what are, your, what are your thoughts on that? How might we restore, how might we work together, as Ted said, as Cheryl said, um, to reclaim these spaces if they can be reclaimed? They can be reclaimed. Um, when they started diking in 1890s, you know, uh, they set something in motion um, and they had no idea how it was really going to end. And we're at the end game for those lands. You know, the, you may not know this, but because of the tectonic subsidence, Humble Bay has the highest rate of sea level rise on the entire West Coast. Over the last century, the water's risen 18 inches. It means those dikes are a foot and a half lower than they were when they built them in the 1890s. They're right now at a threshold. The average dike is about a 10-foot elevation. Uh, the 10 foot contour. Our average king tide is almost nine feet. And so uh, in 2005, we had a king tide and we had a storm with wind waves. And the water got to a record nine and a half feet. And the governor declared a state of disaster on Humboldt Bay. That wasn't even a foot higher than our average king tide. And so when we think about sea level rise on Humboldt Bay, we're not thinking about 100 years out. We're talking about one in two and three decades. As the water rises to that 10-foot elevation, with one foot of sea level rise, our king tides will be at that threshold. Uh, as it crosses that threshold, half of the 50% of the 41 miles of dikes will be overtopped with just uh, two feet of sea level rise. And so all of those seven to 8,000 acres are going to start to be reclaimed by Wigi. You know, as each accident happens and we breach one area, there's 24 separate dike uh, hydrologic units around the bay. So all you need is one breach in a, in a shoreline and all the land behind that common shoreline will become tidal again, become part of the bay. And so uh, that's starting to happen now. And between now, the state's projection for three feet or one meter of sea level rise is 2060. So between, over the next 40 years, all of these dikes are gonna be overtopped. Those seven to 8,000 acres uh, will be reconnected with the bay. They'll be flooded on a daily basis with high tides and low tides, and they'll start uh, restoring themselves. They'll rebuild back some salt marsh, but as I mentioned earlier, the ground has sunk almost one to three feet. So we'll get a lot more mud flat than we will salt marsh. Um, with the, when these dikes are overtopped. And so we don't have to wait for that to happen. We can make it happen. We can go out and we can breach the dikes. Down on the Humboldt Bay National Wildlife Refuge, an area called White Slough, uh, we decided that 
the, uh, good way to restore the salt marsh in that area was to, uh, to essentially lower the elevation of the dikes and let the high tides flow over the top of them and breach the dikes so the land behind the dikes became fully tidal again. And they brought in a lot of dirt, almost a quarter of a million yards of dirt to raise the elevation. So now it's growing salt marsh. And it's only been there for about a year, year and a half, or two years. We don't have a lot of dirt to come in and fill up seven to 8,000 acres of former land. So as those areas are breached, uh, they, the outer fringes will be salt marsh and the inner area would be mud flat. But as sea level continues to rise, based on the three-dimensional maps that have been made of the bay, when we have, say, 10 feet of sea level rise, that's three meters, that's projected to happen by 2120, 100 years from now. When we go from two meters of sea level rise to three meters of sea level rise, Badawat starts flowing back into Humboldt Bay. Mm. And we'll have a new source of sediment. We won't have to truck it, it'll flow in with the river. We'll probably start growing huge salt marsh plains on the Mad River bottom or the Badawat bottom. And it'll spread out into Arcata Bay. And so we'll have a new ecosystem uh, that's expanding. Uh, Arcata Bay will probably get shallower. Things are gonna change with sea level rise. But I don't think all the changes are negative. I think there's a lot of opportunities to reestablish valuable ecosystems that we lost, that we intentionally took away without knowing what we were doing. And so hopefully we have the wisdom to let the bay do what it wants to do. We can't stop sea level rise. It's gonna keep happening for centuries. We need to adapt to it and, uh, and see the opportunities and uh, just take our time. We had a lot of canoes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just going to wrap up um, kind of what we've you know, talked about here, um, say some words, and then uh, we'd like to open it up to you all. If you have questions of anybody on the panel, we'd love to know. Um, so before we do that, I just want to echo what Alderon said. Um, you know, uh, sea level rise is a very scary thing, especially for people who are living on coastal areas and islands, right? Where are they going to go? They will be sea level rise refugees, and we have to figure out how to care for them, support them, help them find safe places to live. We will have refugees, and we have to figure that out as a community, as a country, and as a world citizen. So, um, but with that said, it's an exciting time, too. And if we can use what's already going to happen, because we can't seem to stop ourselves or help ourselves, right, with the environment and, and the changes that we're creating and impacting in the world, how can we... Um, use this time to reclaim these spaces and make them, um, you know, the salt marshes they were and are meant to be and build these ecosystems. And how do we help those landowners um, figure out where they're going to move to, you know, their agricultural activities or their commercial activities? How do we support them and so that they aren't devastated? Because they will be if we don't help them. You know, if we don't work as a community to figure out how to, how to help them and support them, they will be financially devastated, too. Um, I also wanted to say that um, our, our practices continued. The ability, um, despite uh, the ongoing early efforts of massacres that happened on Wiat people as well as other indigenous people in this area, um, our practices continued whether it be our family outings and the love that we had for each other in our community, whether it was a covert um, gathering of materials or medicines or um, singing our songs or speaking our language or conducting our ceremony. You know, it all went under the radar because to protect ourselves, to protect our families and our children, um, so that's, that's important to know because we're still here today, right? We're sitting, you have three we are people here sitting in front of you. So we survived. Um, 
we participated in the economies that arose because of Euro-American settlers, right? We participated in some way we would help build towns, uh, we would go and log, we would work in the fish factories filleting fish, um, we would take people, we would uh, uh, carry people um, from a disaster into our homes and feed them and care for them. So we have been part of not only the economy, but the community always. We're always here. Um, we have been, um, we have been protectors. So a lot of us nowadays call, call it stewardship, right? Yeah. For myself, I personally say we live in reciprocal relationship with the land because to me, stewardship means I'm gonna go over there and I'm gonna pull those, in those uh, invasive plants and I'm gonna plant native plants and then I'm gonna put up a sign to myself because look what I did, I stewarded that area. Well, with We Out People, it's more than that and I probably, you probably, some of you might even take to heart what I say and, and find some similar thoughts in what I'm gonna say. To us, it means we take care of that place so that that place takes care of us. We take care of you know, um, that waterway so that that waterway takes care of us. It's a reciprocal, ongoing relationship with landscape, with critters, with water, with plants, air, animal, any, uh, each other. That's important to us and we do that to this day. Um, finally, I just want to say that we are resilient. Um, you know, it's very heart-wrenching to read the um, historical documents that some of us have had to read, uh, you know, in order to do the jobs that we do. Um, you know, I don't wish it on anybody to read about any of the retellings of massacres. Don't go out and try to find them. There's no reason for you to know. Just know it was bad. Um, because it hurts your heart. That said, we're here. We are resilient people, we are strong people, we are survivors, and we are thrivers. Okay? So I... <laughs> so I, I just want you to carry that with you, okay? Um, you don't need to pity me but you, need to, you do need to stand with me. You need to ally with me. If you, um, you know, support this community that we live in, that's what I want, right? Don't pity me, ally with me. Let's do this work. Let's take care of our area. So those are my final thoughts and words, and um, I, if you all don't mind, I, I'd like to open it up to see if there's any questions. Yeah. The geomorphologists that I've talked to up at uh, Cal Poly, Humboldt, um, they've told me that the Mad River did not flow into Humboldt Bay. But one of the first maps that uh, was uh, found of the bay was the 1806 map that the Russians drew. They drew uh, the Mad River flowing into Humboldt Bay. It's really clear. Maybe it was a big bay, maybe it was a big water when they were here or something like that, but they did show that it went in. I think maybe the, the, um, the in geologic investigation hasn't been thorough enough to really answer that question because they didn't find the coarse sediment under the Mad River bottom. But the Mad River is higher in elevation than the bay, and when it would overtop its banks before it was uh, levied, all of that flood water flowed down to the bay. That's why you have Liscombe Slough and it flows in, into Mad River Slough. Um, I can't see how it did not flow into Humboldt Bay. And uh, so, but just based on the existing surface elevation and the modeled water elevations that are, we're going to see up to 10 feet, they join together east of Hammond Bridge is where they would uh, merge. Um, 
So essentially the, the Mellel, Dune, Pine, Spruce, Forest, the, the big parabolic dunes, all that area could become a barrier island type feature. Um, you know, one of the things we haven't talked about is will the jetties function with two and three meters of sea level rise? You know, will we have a harbor? And, uh, and lastly, I just based on what Marnie was saying is, is that if we're a community, you know, centered around this bay, uh, the most at risk uh, areas are three disadvantaged communities, King Salmon, Fields Landing, and Fairhaven. They're all at risk of disappearing in the next few decades. Uh, somebody, we have to step up to help them. Um, they're not municipalities. They are going to need help. Thank you. Thank you. Good question. I just wanted to um, relay something that uh, Alderon said. He said, uh, big water. And up in the, in the Great Lakes area, there's a tribe. I can't remember the tribe. But it was uh, their word for one of the lakes was Weegee. The same word we use for Humboldt Bay is Weegee. And I said, well, what does that mean in your language? He says, big water. So you reminded me that it was big water. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's what the we word meant as we, but we are akin to their language system. So it could be uh, similar. So we, big water. So it could have been big water. Now it's a little bit smaller, but uh, <laughs> might be big water again. <laughs> It might have been just we. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to go back to we. Is there anybody? Yeah. I can't. Good evening. Hi. Um, there's a plaque uh, right above the ball field in Arcata that sort of uh, is uh, right on the subject you're talking about. It's called A View of Arcata's Past. And it basically, a couple different things. It's uh, put there by the state and also the WIATs. And it's a memorial for the leader. It's also uh, a history of exactly what you're talking about, how the Mad River, um, we talked about for the last 5,000 years that uh, indigenous people would kayak uh, our canoe from that area to the old Arcata Road where they had settlements. Um, and it also shows you a very nice um, picture of what you know the functioning system looked like um, prior to what Alderon was addressing with all the the diking, and uh, so um, there's a lot going on around that subject matter with sea level rise and potential dikes um, that people want to like add on to, um, and uh, so I walk by that often, and uh, I saw an article in the New York Times about a year a year ago that basically. Um, uh, wanted ideas as far as uh, executive order uh, under Biden, um, as far as addressing um, working with landowners and indigenous people of restoring areas in the United States. And this is also part of the 30% goal of, uh, of our species is going to go on as far as uh, our animals, they need to have these big areas. So I, um, I wrote the Interior Department during the scoping period and with an idea of the west and to the south, uh, which are pasture lands that were once uh, the, the Wiats areas and also uh, they need to be restored. So I sort of planted the seed and uh, I'm interested if, in someone taking that and uh, develop it into a project, but there's a, there's a, quite a bit of information with the federal government right now um, addressing that. Thank you. You, you want us to answer? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I didn't hear a question. Uh, anybody's thinking about, uh, would like to pursue. I mean, it kind of, it's fitting in with sort of everything you're thing? saying up there. And yeah. I mean, I just, I just was a guy that, you know, put this proposal out there and just would like to know if, if, if somebody else is thinking along those lines or uh, yeah. taking action in that area. We, but we, yeah. we, we, we can, we're seeing right now uh, with the levees, there's quite a bit 
going on with the grand jury report for sea level rise, the wastewater treatment plant, um, uh, growth in this area that there, so there's pressure to actually build those levees up and, and so it doesn't seem like that's the right direction. We've seen the levees uh, blow out in uh, one of the hurricanes in uh, New Orleans, and and they've blown out in Sacramento, where a friend of mine lost her whole community with that blowout a few several years ago. And so, I don't know where those levees. The creator did not put levees in when he created the rivers and the and the land. So why we think that we can do better than the creator is beyond me. I don't want to fight with him. <laughs> and, and I would like to say that the tribe is involved in the 30 by 30 initiative. We do that through our natural resources department. Um, and uh, the tribal council uh, is, is involved um, with the listening sessions and things like that. Yeah, so thank you. Anybody else? I know that we're time is clicking away. Can we have the house lights come up a yeah. little bit? Is that pop? Thank you. Oh, there you all are. <laughs> I am wondering <laughs> if the Wiat people have in your stories um, anticipation or of of Cascadia subduction events mm -hmm. because I think we're. Uh, quite overdue in our area to have such a thing, and I'm, I'm just wondering if you have as stories, because um, I've heard it told that the, there's natural uh, hazard events that become disasters when people are involved, um, and I just wonder if you have that in your stories that we can learn from. Uh, well, I know that we have stories of seeing whales up in Batwat, so, um, uh, and we have our um, our story of the Wiat, which is the hero story. Um, do you want me to tell it? Go right ahead. Okay, uh, so th this no, wait, wait. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, <laughs> I thought you were going to tell it. Do you want to tell it? No, okay. I was just teasing. I'm just going to give you a rough idea, but yes, we have had these things happen before. Um, and, and so, like I said, I've had um, uh, stories our elders tell me about, yeah, or, and other people, other indigenous people, our neighbors tell us about whales up into the river, like in the Klamath and, yeah. you know. Um, but one of, one of our stories is about um, a blockage on the Wiat, so the Eel River. And um, our people were crying around, you know, and, and our, one of our heroes, Southwest Young Man, we call him, comes along and it's like, why are you all crying? What is going on? And they're like, you know, everybody's like, oh, we're so hungry. They're, you know, all the fish have stopped coming down. The water's coming down. We don't know what's happening. We're hungry. And he says, well, I'll, I'll go look. I'll go take a walk up river and I'll go see if I can figure out what's going on. And so he goes up the river, you know, it takes him a couple days to get there and, and he gets up there and he sees something. And sure enough, it's blocking the river. So he tears it down. And so he, you know, takes his time, and he's like, oh, you know, that should do it. That should take care of it. And so he rests for a little bit, and then a couple few days later, he goes back down to where he had met the people, and he said, hey, you know, is everything okay? And they're like, yes, thank you so much. Oh, my gosh, we're not hungry anymore. The salmon have come back. The river have come back. You know, the water's come back. The eels have come back. Thank you so much. And, and he said, yeah, there was a blockage up there. Well... What's blocking the Eel River right now? Yeah, a dam, um, right? That is has been the FERC relicensing has been abandoned by a company that gets energy from that dam, um, and so for myself, I'm like, oh, that's the same, except for now we have to be our own heroes. We have to be those heroes, right? For our community, for our river, and, and let's take down that dam, like, so that the water can flow. I don't know if you've been down to the Wiat lately after all these rains, it's gorgeous. I haven't seen that Thank much water. Bank. Yeah, I haven't seen that much water in, I don't even know, this, lots of years. 
And I just think it's gorgeous and it's flowing. Um, so we do have examples in our, whether it's our stories or our memories, our remembrances, yeah, of, of things that have happened and that happen again. So yeah. the great news on that part is that dam is coming down because these people realize that, oh, we shouldn't have built this dam here. There might be an earthquake and all the water's going to go. <laughs> so they are making the recommendation. I don't know if you've seen the Lost Coast, but it's been out there a lot that they have made it that Scott's Dam is probably mm -hmm. coming down. So, you know, that's a plus for the Wiats and the tribes that have helped us with it mm -hmm. and the other agencies that helped us because there's been other agencies that have been fighting this. And this big source we call pg e they're realizing, oh, we shouldn't have built it here. It's a bad mistake. Yep, we've been telling you that since the day one. So we do have our stories. And there's a lot of stories that we do have. You know, we'd like to share it. And if you guys want to see more of our stories, join, go onto our website, weout.us, and a lot of our stories are there as well. You know, we're, we want to share our information. We want to share our traditional knowledge and our culture with you, with our language, with our stories. So feel free to go to weout.us, and I'm plugging that line in there. <laughs> To, to look at the stories and look at the language and how far Marty's department has come with the language and the stories. This is a story from not Weot country, but up in uh, Crescent City area. Back in the 60s, they start taking rocks out of um, Crescent City Bay and pulling, out, pulling those big rocks out and putting them out further in the ocean. And the old people, the elders, at that time said, don't do that. That's not going to be a good thing. That the creator put that, that barricade there for a reason. And no, the, the army of engineers or engineer armies, whatever it's called, um, did it anyway against, popular, against the elders, not the popular demand, because popular didn't have any idea what native knowledge was and still is. And, and the old people, the old elders said, no, don't do that. It's only going to cause problems. Then Anchorage had an earthquake. And it wiped out up to 4th or 5th Street in Crescent City. Had there been that breakwater there that they didn't take out, that they took out, it wouldn't have done as much damage. They would, they thought, it would not have done as much damage. So what did he do? Put millions and millions and millions of dollars, and you see that great big jack. I I call them jacks. Yeah. 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 What what they called? Dolos. Dolos. Oh, I was right in my head. Dolos. <laughs> Theodore. <Yep>. Be nice. <laughs> I got your mom on speed dial. <laughs> and so they spent millions and millions of dollars putting those doughs back in where they took out all the boulders. So that wouldn't happen again. Somebody needed some money. <laughs> for those dough but donors. so that, that's sometimes you really, not sometimes, but you really need to listen to the elders of the community whether they're native elders or non-native elders, because they've lived a lifetime in that area. They've seen the passings of time of what's happening. And I'm not Italian. I talk with my hands. I see Marnie do the same thing, talking with our hands. A sign language, man. But it, it happens throughout the United States, not just here on the North Coast, but it's happened throughout indigenous peoples, that they, we're not, since we don't have that degree, we don't know a lot. Yeah. But some of our elders have a degree in just being good knowledge bearers. So as I understand it, it's four o'clock and four minutes after or till? Before. Oh, we got Time for one Time more. Time for one more. There's a hand right there. <laughs> okay, I'll be quick. Um, I'm really interested in a bunch of stuff you guys talked about. Thank you for sharing all this knowledge with us today. It's amazing. I wanted to hear from you guys about um, reverting back to the the we got names for things. 
like the way Sue Meg has been renamed. I would love for it all to be renamed. So um, what's up with that? I, th I think we're on the same page. <laughs> so our, our goal is, and you know, we've always said that we want we got language all over our traditional territory. Cause our, I don't know, if we, our territory is huge. We go from Bear Mountain Ridge to Chalk Mountain to Berry Summit to Little River. That's how big our ancestral mm -hmm. boundary is. And as far as we can see out the coast. So, We've always said we want our we out language everywhere. And if people are willing to work with the try and put the language there, we're willing to give you the language. We want it to be there, you know, because we want our ancestral names to be back. You know, like Cheryl and I said, it was called Indian Island, but we went back to say, no, it's Tulawat. This is where we begin. This is our creation story. We're not going to call it Indian Island. We're not going to call it Gunther Island. We're going to name it where it should have been, and that's Tulawat. Now, understand, Tulawat was one of the villages there. There was another village on the other side. Mm -hmm. But Tulawa is where we held our ceremony, our high dance, our where we know ceremony. So we gave it that honor by calling it Tulawa, mm -hmm. because that's the balance of us. And if we can put language and names everywhere, we will. We're starting with Eureka, Jirichirichi. We Del Artes have we out words everywhere. Mm -hmm. We're even having the schools now. The grammar schools working with us putting language in their school grounds, because they're recognizing that we live on we out land but we can live both together in both worlds. We can call it both, mm -hmm. you know? And I'm, I'm so happy that Sumig is actually called Sumig back. It's what it should be. It's a ceremonial grounds. It's where we do ceremonies. Mm -hmm. All of our ceremony grounds should be respected. It should have its original name. So, you know, I got that from Michelle. We're gonna put, we got words everywhere. So <laughs> yes. that's the plan. And thanks for learning them with us. We appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. We should really start with Wiggy and get rid of Humboldt Bay. <laughs> yeah, and they then, never even came. And got a plot of land. What's that about? <laughs> Humboldt never visited this area, and it's a, not a bay. It's a lagoon. Yeah. So we got it completely wrong. <laughs> thank you all for coming. Appreciate yes, thank you, guys. Chewak. Chewak. Chewak.